Hello, everyone, to tonight's program. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this evening's Artist and Inspiration program. My name is Sarah McNamara, and I'm the Institutional Advancement Manager at the Adirondack Experience. And I would like to start this program by acknowledging that the Adirondack Experience is situated on the Aboriginal territories of the Mohawk and Abenaki communities. Indigenous people continue to live in this region and practice their teachings and life ways. In July, the museum will be opening our permanent artist and inspiration in the wild exhibition. Construction is currently underway and you can check for project updates on our website and social media. This monthly speaker program focused on the topics and artists that will be featured in the exhibition will continue as we prepare for the opening. We hope that you will continue to tune in. Tonight, I am delighted to introduce three Adirondack artists. These three artists all have created one of the most iconic objects to the region, the Adirondack chair. And yet, only one of them is more traditionally known for making furniture. Tim Fortune completed his bachelor's and master's degrees while studying in Italy, Philadelphia, and New York City. He taught art for 16 years before returning to his hometown of Saranac Lake in 1988. You can see him working at his studio, the small fortune studio and gallery on Main Street, where he paints intimate images of the Adirondacks in both watercolor and in oil. He continues to foster the vibrant arts communities in the village. Barry Lobdell is also based in Saranac Lake, where he is a longtime member of the Adirondack Artist Guild. His work is always on display there and is regularly part of many exhibitions and gallery shows in the area. He has won numerous Best in Show and Best Photography awards from competitions throughout the North Country. Raised in the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains, Jonathan Sweet is a contemporary American furniture artist. Today, he creates one-of-a-kind custom wood furnishings and interiors. Jonathan has been a participant in the museum's annual Rustic Furniture Fair. Throughout this evening's presentation, please feel free to submit any questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And to start this program, we're going to be learning a little bit more about each of our speakers. And we'll start alphabetically with Tim. Go ahead, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the Adirondack Experience for pulling this all together. I think it's great to have three uh, different artists who work with three different mediums and but have a, uh, a connection here uh, all producing this, this Adirondack chair, our interpretation, I should say, of the Adirondack chair. So this is my time to kind of introduce myself, um, give you a little bit of uh, detail about my background. Um, it won't take but a few minutes. Um, I first became interested in art when I was taking history uh, from uh, at my first college I attended and didn't realize I actually um, could uh, pursue a career in art until late my junior year. So I graduated, got married to uh, Diana, and uh, we moved to Florida and uh, started my career down there. Um, I taught for about 12 years in elementary school down there, in addition to other, other uh, teaching gigs. And I also had a working studio at the same time, much like I have up here right now. Um, after a variety of jobs, uh, commercial art, teaching, et cetera, uh, we both decided that maybe it's time to move back to our, our, our roots, let's say, and that is Saranac Lake. We were both raised uh, in Saranac Lake. So after 16 years in Florida, we moved back to Saranac Lake in 1988. And after about four years, uh, maybe, no, maybe six years, I decided to open up a studio gallery uh, in downtown Saranac Lake. 
and it is a studio, a working studio, where I'm there painting, creating my my works there. And after 29 years, I'm still there, um, celebrating my 30th year uh, next year. Um, much of my my effort there in uh, uh, at my studio is also involved uh, revitalization of downtown Saranac Lake through the arts. And so that has taken uh, uh, a lot of my creative uh, efforts uh, have been thrown into the revitalization uh, of the arts uh, of the downtown area. So uh, during that time, uh, I, I created the the artworks, art walks, which are are now uh, still still going uh, after about 23 years, I believe. Uh, I started the uh, Classic Film Festival that ran for about eight years and uh, ran its course. And I also created the Adirondack Artist Guild uh, where Barry Lobdell resides. Um, so it, it's been great um, uh, producing work in Saranac Lake and being such a, an important part of this community. Um, of course, you can, since it is a commercial space, you can visit my gallery a Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to three. Although it'll be closed in March because we're escaping uh, the cold during the month of March. Um, if Cheryl, uh, maybe you could now uh, give me, yes, boy, you're quick. Um, so here is uh, an example of one of my very large watercolors. So this is about uh, oh, 36 by 48, something like that. That's the image size. And that is a watercolor. Um, and so the past, uh, since 2007, I've been focusing on very large watercolors or watercolors in general. So if you could just start scrolling through, um, I'll, I'll just mention a few words about each of these, not to do all of them. Oh, well, that's the chair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that a little later as will all of us. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah, it's another, uh, obviously a large vertical one. This is even larger than the previous one. This piece is, um, it, it kind of reflects my approach to painting uh, the Adirondacks because it's kind of a, an encounter with the tree rather than, than scenes. Uh, I tend to do, uh, images that you would find just walking uh, an Adirondack trail. And uh, so that's been my preference for most of that time. Next. Okay, next. <laughs> well, this one's all right. It's it's more of a, of a conceptual piece, kind of dark wood sort of uh, piece. And actually after I painted it, I thought, well, some people aren't gonna like this. It's kind of dark, but actually I got a strong uh, reaction to this. Next. Okay. Now this these uh, is a hawthorn uh, bush on my property, and uh, so this one uh, is is a piece that I love painting because of the uh, intricacy of it. But if you get close to the image, you'll see it's it's painted fairly quickly. In other words, it's not labored to get a photographic effect. So I had a lot of fun painting that. And um, I think uh, the viewer um, perhaps had a lot of time uh, enjoying that well uh, as well, both close up and, and stepping back from it. Um, maybe one more. Okay, this is one of my favorite pieces. Um, uh, this piece is, as you can see, pretty much a one color piece, except for the trunk. This this goes up about six and a half, seven feet. And uh, this is a, a, another image from my property. And uh, it was just, I was went off trail a little bit and uh, discovered <laughs> this this beautiful tree. And it was like there was like an aisle leading up to it. It was like being in a cathedral or a church. 
and that was the center focal point or the altar of it. Um, and that was an inspiring image, and I was so happy to be able to paint that. Okay, uh, I'm not yeah, sure how much time yeah, we have left. Question here. Yeah. Um, so we had one of our viewers asking if um, the process of you painting these, are you painting them out in the forest or are you taking a picture and then coming back and painting in your studio? Good question. Because of the scale of these, I'm taking a reference photograph and bringing it back and painting it in my, in my studio gallery. Um, and it takes a lot of planning because it's a small studio space. So I have to start working flat and kind of scroll it behind my desk forward and backwards. And then as I near completion, I put it up on the wall. And so I can step back from it and continue painting. Most of these, just about all of these are transparent watercolor. There's no white added to the paper. And you may have noticed some spots of light in some of the previous ones. Uh, that's where the color is actually lifted off the paper, uh, where the, pa the color is applied first. And then I add water, I scrub it with a brush and lift it back off with paper towels or a clean brush. So I get that that kind of backlit effect uh, from uh, a lot of these. Can't hear you, Sarah. And one more oh. question before okay. we move on to our next. Um, okay. We have, do you ever take part in the Old Forge watercolor exhibition in September? Uh, no, I, I usually don't because I have to be in my studio because I to keep those regular hours, especially in the summer. So that pretty much anchors me. But I did have a wonderful show there years ago where I filled the gallery with all my my large pieces, and uh, uh, I was very thankful to to have that show because it's a it's a beautiful space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now, um, if Barry, you could tell us a little bit about your uh, background and perspective. Sure. Well, like Tim, I'd like to reiterate how much uh, I appreciate the museum doing this. It's great to be featured like this. Um, and like Tim, I live in Cernic Lake. I'm a photographer and I've been here for about 27 years now. A newbie in other words. And uh, <laughs> I spent about the same amount of time living in the Saratoga Springs area. Um, as been said, I am a member in the Adronic Artists Guild where uh, I began that membership during the second year of its existence. And I've been a member ever since. It's been a great opportunity for me to get my work out into the community without having to actually have my own gallery. This way it's affordable and great for everybody who's been involved. Um, the work that I've been doing in the Adirondacks has primarily been landscape photography. Uh, and I have, I'll have several examples of those to show as I, we get along here. Um, before I came to the North Country, as I said, I lived in the Saratoga Springs area and uh, had been in college in Albany at Albany State. That's where I got involved in photography. And early days, I was very much a fan of photographers like Henry Cartier-Bresson and uh, Eva Rubenstein, Ralph Gibson. These are all people who, uh, photographers who photograph people a lot and uh, as a primary subjects. And just if uh, I could get slide number one up. Okay, this is a piece that I call Eavesdropping with Prometheus. It was taken at Rockefeller Center. And most anyone who's seen a picture of this statue has seen it from the front where it overlooks the ice skating rink, which doubles as a restaurant during the uh, warmer months. But uh, I liked this view better. And uh, the way it got its title is uh, if you look down below the statue, you see a uh, some people sitting at a table and having a discussion. So hence eavesdropping with Prometheus was the title of that piece. Um, slide two, if you would. Okay, I call this one Ray was here. 
because uh, one of the tattoos on his arms actually says Ray was here. <laughs> and Ray was a, um, a chicken farmer. And I met him at a, a livestock auction in Broad Alban, New York. And I had been inside the auction building and looking around there and didn't see anything that was particularly interesting to me photographically at that point. So I went out into the parking lot and there was Ray getting his chickens ready to uh, bring inside. And so anyway, I was struck by his, his tattoos, the arm on his arms. And so I asked him if he'd pose for me and that he did. Uh, he told me that every year he'd go to the Saratoga County Fair and he'd get a new tattoo. <laughs> um, if you look at the tattoos, you'll see they're, they're probably not the best quality that you can see these days in particular, but in any event, he liked them. They were great and he was a great subject. So that's why he got photographed. Um, slide three. Okay, um, getting away from Saratoga Springs and the uh, New York in general, I like to travel. And this was out in South Dakota uh, at Badlands National Park. And I was quite struck by this scene. Uh, the relationship between the mountain air there and the cloud were kind of reflecting each other. And, but it wasn't quite right when I first looked at it. So I kept moving my camera around. And finally, I found a spot where I could, uh, <laughs> it has the illusion almost that the cloud could be a plume of smoke coming out of a hidden chimney from the ranch house there. And I like that. And so that's how that picture got evolved. I've used many different cameras uh, during my career. And this was taken with a, um, a panoramic camera. Uh, the next slide takes us to Florida. And uh, I was in South Beach, which is part of Miami, of course, and walking around the streets in late afternoon. And just this particular mixture of color and form uh, caught my eye. And uh, it actually won a best in show in one of the local contests here. Um, the next slide is number five. And this was taken in Saratoga Springs. Uh, the building is called, well, it was, it was an old firehouse. And at the time that I took this photograph, there was actually a restaurant in it called the Old Firehouse Restaurant, of course. <laughs> Uh, totally unplanned. Um, I was actually pumping gas next door to the building. And I noticed this, the building's forms and the color and uh, grabbed a few quick shots and this one worked out very well. Uh, <laughs> speaking of Saratoga, this, uh, well, the story behind this particular image, um, takes me into uh, February. <laughs> I was sitting around uh, eve just daydreaming about what I could do that summer. And I suddenly had this particular idea. And as it developed, I had a friend who was a painter who painted a large mural for me. And then I cut the jockey's faces out so that uh, people at the racetrack could stand behind it and I could photograph them, obviously. And it's a, it's, I got the, uh, the idea approved through Naira's uh, administration at the track and everybody thought it was a great idea and I did it for 12 years. Wow. So it was, it was quite popular. I had some people who would come back year after year after year <laughs> you know, to have the same picture made of their faces basically. So that was, that was fun. Um, picture number seven, I think we're going to get into the North Country here. Yes, this one is called uh, Frozen Adirondack Dawn and it's a view out on Middle Saranac Lake. And it's actually a view which I had seen the summer before as I was canoeing. And I knew that I really liked the shot but I had no place to put my tripod down. <laughs> because I was in a canoe. So 
the uh, following February, actually, February is a big month for me, apparently. Um, I woke up one night, I was in, couldn't sleep, and I suddenly remembered this scene. And so I grabbed all my equipment and got out there. And this photograph was taken uh, just before dawn. And uh, it's been one of my mo most popular images. I'm very glad that I got myself out of bed that morning. The next slide is called Forest for the Trees. And somehow, even though winter is not my favorite season, I like canoeing better than skiing, for instance. Um, I love looking at winter and getting out and walking around in it. And so uh, this was just a stand of, of pine trees not far from where I live. Uh, that I thought looked pretty remarkable. And it's also been a very good image for me in terms of sales. Uh, the next picture, that one is actually, uh, we'll, we'll skip to that one. That's a view that I took quite recently, probably about a month ago of Whiteface Mountain uh, from Norman Ridge in Vermontville. And I generally don't take photographs with so much negative space in them, but the moon was up there and it just seemed right this way. I tried it several other ways and this is the image that worked for me. Next slide, please. Okay, this is one that I call Last Journey. And it was taken while I was canoeing on Osgood Pond. And uh, I've, canoed on lots and lots of ponds and lakes around here. I've never yet seen another leaf like this floating along the water in this fashion on its edge like that. Usually they're there with, they're lying on their backs or something. <laughs> so I chased it down and got a photograph of it. And uh, again, that's, that's been a very good image for me. Next picture I believe is, yes. This photograph is called Tea House at White Pine Camp, which coincidentally is also at Osgood Pond. And I took this photograph while I was working on a project called Places for the Spirit for the Lake Placid Institute. And <clears throat> what's important to me about this image at this point is that it was taken within a week of September 11th, 2001. And so during such a horrendous time for our country, I found and that canoeist found some real peace here in the Adirondacks. And uh, so that's what happened there. <laughs> the picture was actually used on the cover of, of a book called Places of a Spirit. And finally, I think, is a photograph called Chevron Sky. I took this picture just last November on Lower Saranac Lake. And the temperature that day was 70 degrees. And it was like a week already into November. So most unusual temperature for us here. And it was a, the conditions of the temperature and, and just the sky were beautiful, really wonderful. But uh, one has to wonder what costs that kind of beauty when, when temperatures are so weird in this kind of a country. So um, I don't know if you have another slide for me or not. I guess not. Okay. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. And Welcome. Jonathan, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your work? Sure, absolutely. Um, like every uh, young person who grows up in uh, upstate New York or in the Adirondacks, uh, you know, once you graduate high school, the first thing you want to do is get out there and experience the world, and see what it has to offer. Uh, so I took the opportunity as a young lad to like travel all around Europe, South America, Central America, um, and then went to graduate, I went to architectural school in Long Island to New York uh, Institute of Technology and studied uh, undergraduate architecture. And 
and really understood what my passion for three-dimensional art was. You know, and a lot of people, you know, it comes into these magnanimous, you know, um, sculptures of buildings. And I thought that was my initial process of, you know, I wanted to do these large canvases. And so if you pull up uh, number 15, the Great Room Fireplace, um, after I went through all of my traveling phases of life, I settled back in the Adirondacks, somewhat similar to Tim coming back up to Saranac Lake. I came back to settle back into Johnstown, New York, and uh, had the opportunity to build uh, a custom home for a client. And, you know, he wanted to be sensible of the Adirondack region, but yet he wanted a Western influence. And so, you know, the requirements were to be as bold as you want to be, Jonathan, and build me a house that nobody has. So if you look at the, the truss work in this particular project, that king post where the bottom bell is, it measures about 44, di 44 inches in diameter. So these are monolithic timbers. <clears throat> and ironically, I interviewed log builders from here to the Catskills to all the way out past Buffalo. And ironically, I found this particular log builder right in my backyard and we harvested these trees no less than 10 miles from the site. They came in green, we peeled them and they were all uh, mortised and fit right on site as they came off the log truck. And so uh, it was pretty spectacular to have, you know, an organic um, building element that actually created a three-dimensional house. Um, and I was just really blessed to have like a, an out-of-the-box project coming from the, like New York City from, from architectural school. You know, you were so... Uh, with parameters from clients and actually this client actually gave me the opportunity to like really didn't give any me any limitations other than some very few parameters and just let me go as an artist to see really what would happen um, and if you went to the next uh, image number 14 great room chairs ottoman sofa um, kind of gives you an overall room uh, image of what this like room was so it was really a, a large great room expansion um that same king post is in the background we did all these handcrafted trusses to create this huge great room loft <clears throat> um kind of using my uh architectural degree we designed all of this but at this point, I've been doing custom construction and house building for 10, 12 years. And I, I really realized that I really gravitated not to doing architecture in the big macro uh, construction vision, but I was gravitating more to like the micro detail. Like, what do the cabinets look like? What does the furniture look like? Um, cause I was more disinterested in like managing, you know, plumbers, electricians, framers, all the trades. And I felt like my talent was kind of being wasted on being a project manager. And I really wanted to engross myself into kind of like the micro detail of like, what can I explore? You know, like what can I really bring to, um, I've done the big canvas, like, can I do part of the small intricate canvas of the painting. Um, so if you went to uh, image number eight, high fall chairs, the back view. At this point, we then we started doing a lot of exploring into the detail of um, 
sculptural furniture and really, you know, what does furniture mean in a, in a setting? Okay, you have a great piece of architecture. Mm -hmm. We've all gone into a, a great room or a house. We've all done it and we've all kept the comments to ourselves, but you see that one piece of furniture or you see all the furniture and you're like, what is that doing in there? Um, so I took it upon myself to be that guy in the, in the house that I designed to say, hey, I want to have a say or I want to build all the furniture that goes in here. And luckily the client uh, acquiesced, gave me the artistic license and said, you know, um, I love the structure that you built. So obviously you really understand the language and the flavor of what's going on. So what can you do furniture wise? So I really got involved in uh, building um, all the furnishings, all of the cabinets, um, anything you could visually see, you know, it was one of those once in a lifetime opportunities to really uh, set forth of what is the artist vision wholeheartedly, you know, encompassing the structure right down to, you know, the, the most minute detail. Um, and then, you know, I finished that particular project and it rather launched me back into having a time to pause. <clears throat> understand who I am, where did, where have I traveled? You know, I extensively traveled through Europe, spent time there, South America. And uh, it was, it was kind of like time to come up with um, a whole new style that was in my mind, but I couldn't really express it. So I just started tinkering around and, uh, you know, you always hear the, um, the saying less is more per se. So I started to pursue um, how could I edit my designs? But before that, if you pull up the reserve cabinet number 16 <clears throat> or number 17, the, the, the door image as well, right after it, this is really kind of like where I was at at the moment where I was trying to create um, movement i was trying to create texture um it, it was more about density of movement and um you would have, actually see it in number 16 the reserve cabinet if you could pull that image up <clears throat> there it is so as you can see, I was throwing a lot of ingredients into a very small space, but yet having symmetry, having um, uh, movement and flow, proportion, um, but there's everything in there from, you know, leather to slate to the traditional trig work to leather to copper to, you know, there's a lot of elements and a lot of movement. Um, but as I was saying, I had this epiphany of trying to edit and just be all about kind of like, you know, when you go through school, sometimes you really don't understand the lessons that you're being taught until later in life. And all of a sudden that may, you marinate on it and all of a sudden you have that aha moment. So like in design school, you know, less is more, you know, edit, be the part T diagram, almost like in, you know, the, if you go to cathedrals in, in Europe, um, a Catholic cathedral, it's in the form of a cross floor plan. That's the part T diagram. I was really trying to understand what was editing and being in its simplest form, which really, led me to the point of, if you pull up image number four, the Carnegie server, about, um, I was walking through the woods one day and it was all about <clears throat> looking at a tree and I didn't was not looking at 
the trunk or the branches, but I was really fixated on the air that was created by the branch and by the trunk of the tree or the tree standing next to it and how far apart they were. And I was just so fixated just how the light was reflecting through it, the volumetric air that was coming through in the light. So I really learned how to edit um, a lot of my designs to be completely simply simplified and very volumetric, almost like a tree standing in the woods where the air coming through the branches, it's really the form. So if you look at this three volume piece or we call it the, the Carnegie piece, um, yes, it's three volumes, but it's really, my whole attention to detail was the air that is carved out between the three volumes and really trying to be sculptural and be almost sympathetic to that, what you call negative space, or like uh, Tim was just explaining uh, earlier in that one shot of the barn with all that expansive space of negativity, where I'm really trying to sculpt the negativity of that volume between the volumes, if everybody can un kind of understand that. Almost like, you know, when you look up in the sky through, um, under a tree and all you see is the branches and the airspace between all the branches. That's really kind of the genesis of the idea and really being sensible about all those spaces that really create the, the piece as a whole, almost like a tree standing as a whole itself, but me, basically it's, it's all air. Um, and then if you went to number 11, the Modak chair, Number, 10, number 11, and then you can go to 10 as well. Oh, that's a great shot. Thank you. Um, this is kind of uh, the, the piece that's uh, currently at the museum that will be on display on permanent. Um, this is my interpretation of an Adirondack chair. This is the back view. Um, it's all bent laminated walnut and a, um, a redwood burl back, but everything has been rather stretched, exploded, and pulled apart so that there's negative space around every part of the chair uh, to create almost like this sculptural um, uh, interpret interpretation of an Adirondack chair um, that is in, you know, uh, in the, in the modern movement um, and trying to, you know, oh, perfect, thank you. That, that also tells a story. Um, and being uh, totally interpretive of negative space, um, being, um, giving homage to the, you know, the traditional Adirondack chair but yeah, interpretive of today's movement and being forward think like where, where can we go from here as far as what an Adirondack chair? I've, I've traveled the country, I've traveled the world and there, I always see an Adirondack chair or an interpretation somewhere in my travels. And it was fun to come back and have this complete different viewpoint of what an Adirondack chair is. And, uh, you know, thank you for the museum for also um, understanding that viewpoint and wanting it in your permanent collection. It, it means a lot to me, uh, obviously, as an artist, um, you know, sometimes our, our ideas are not always uh, accepted, but, you know, always, sometimes it's. So um, thank you for my, my couple of minutes. Uh, any questions, let me know. Thank you, Jonathan. And you, you did a great job segueing into my, my next question about <laughs> how, how you guys took your artistic um, background and moved into the Adirondack chair and specifically the chairs we have in our collection. So if um, Tim and Barry could perhaps discuss their pieces in a similar fashion, that'd be great. Okay. Um, and I wanna, watch the time. I guess we only have 20 minutes left. So 
uh, I'll, I'll try to make my comments uh, fit. Um, uh, the common uh, connection between Barry and myself is that both of our chairs were generated because of a uh, L L.A. Placid Center for the Arts had a Adirondack art chairs exhibition starting in 2002, where they gave each of the artists a chair, a basic chair, unfinished kind of chair, Adirondack chair. And uh, Barry did his in 2002. I did mine in 2004. So the picture you see here, uh, maybe we could show the uh, original number one, the, the number one uh, photograph of the chair itself. And then we'll go to this one really quickly. Now, what, while Cheryl's bringing up the picture of the actual chair that I designed, this is a picture of myself and my good friend, Dave Vanna, who has the skills to actually make my chair. And what we're doing there is bending, there it is. Uh, so this is the concept of this chair was the idea of metamorphosis going from the ground or the roots of the tree in a very elegant and simple way, winding its way up as a vine or a, a, a growth would happen very organically and, and as loose as I could make it. And it kind of reminded me a little bit of Jonathan's chair with the roots in the back of the chair. So this uh, chair is obviously one you cannot sit in. And actually, if one were to touch it, it actually moves because of the re a rebar or the reinforcing bar, which is connecting all of those slats. The arms are positioned in a way that they are in a, in a kind of a state of movement. And the three slats in the back are that way as well. Everything seems to be moving and quite not uh, ready to become a chair yet. So uh, if you go back to the, the previous uh, picture, Cheryl, that one would show us bending the bar. And then we'll just go really quickly from those as well. There we are bending the bar. The cardboard is simply uh, the shape that I wanted. So it's a two man operation. So we managed to, to bend the bar using a pipe and boards and, and true Adirondack spirit, just getting it done. <laughs> and the next one is uh, now David Vanna, my friend, uh, actually cut out the wood part on the bottom and then uh, kind of uh, made it into, because of my, uh, with my drawing as a guide. And then I painted the illusion of bark on the bottom. Here on the right hand side, you can see how it's transitioning, beginning to, it wasn't, painting wasn't complete, going from the roots, then gradually up into the, the coloration of the wood. Um, and then, uh, so that kind of explains it. And that one, uh, the last one here, I think it's the last, yes, it is. Uh, on the left-hand photograph, you can see my rather uh, simple model of the chair and what I wanted. And I'm, my arm, of course, is on the, 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 the actual chair, which is being clamped. Uh, he's clamping it together. And of course, the wood, uh, clamps or the slats will be taken off after it dries. And then the one on the right, I believe is the finished one. I can't remember if I continued to, to paint it or not. Now, one surprise to me is when it actually got up to that height, it, it took on the look of a person. And with the, with the, uh, the arm rests actually moving. And so add to that to the fact that it actually moves if you touch it. It, it takes on a human element. So uh, one of the reasons I chose to do a sculptor, people know me as a painter, is I wanted to kind of go outside my comfort zone and do something kind of unexpected uh, in that people wouldn't expect me to be actually uh, doing a sculpture. So this was a, a nice challenge that I set up for me and, uh, and had so much fun doing it and, uh, it was exhibited for uh, a period of time as were the other chairs. And then the Adirondack Museum at that point acquired uh, the chair and uh, it will be on permanent exhibit uh, along with the other chairs as well. So 
I hope you can all attend the opening in about four months, I guess, in the summer of the of the uh, the new exhibition. Okay, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, obviously you can't get too comfortable in Tim's chair. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It'll spring you out of it. <laughs> my chair kind of demands to be sat upon, actually. Um, as I contemplated how to do my chair and what I wanted to do with it, I kept thinking, well, I'm going to do something scenic. And, uh, and then I just went from one thing to another and I came up with a, a photograph, which I thought maybe, well, that's a nice scene. Maybe I could do that and just spread that out on the chair. And then I started to think about what I really wanted to say with the chair. And well, this was just a couple of years after uh, George Bush defeated Al Gore in the 2000 Olymp um, Olympics <laughs> <laughs> elections. <laughs> and uh, and uh, to my way of thinking, Mr. Bush had been making some very bad decisions from an environmental perspective. Um, so I wanted to say something about that with the chair. And what I started to do was to come up with, with things which would illustrate that. And well, that's not the one you were supposed to see first. <laughs> 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 but, um, Okay, I, uh, I, I went for footprints, animal footprints, and, uh, and a guy with a, like a hazmat suit on doing something like a pipe and with a pipe. And I turned it, and I had money all over the chair. <laughs> Hundreds of dollar bills all over the chair. They were all just copies of hundred dollar bills, of course. But um, they were just to illustrate what was making things dirty in in the environment. And it was all about money. And it was all about how we spend our money and how we what we do do to protect the environment. And and I didn't see a lot of the the things that we do do to protect it happening. Um, one of the headlines that I put on the chair had to do with uh, Mr. Bush deciding to take away protections for salmon. And um, just that there were a whole different, many different categories of things that were just going wrong. Acid rain, was happening all the time at that point in the Adirondacks. Some lakes were practically dead um, because of the uh, contaminants that came from the Midwest. And so that, that has been rectified to some extent at this point, hopefully further than I'm thinking. <laughs> but um, so I started to put all these things together on my previously lovely scene. And uh, you can see the dollar signs floating around in the air and uh, the fellow with the pipe there standing on the shore of the, the lake. And I was happy with all of that. I knew I was saying something. Um, one of the things I found, I hope you'll be able to read this. I'm not sure. I reversed it, so maybe you could. It's a Doonesbury. Can you see that to read it? No. Uh, no. Not too, not too <laughs> well. Okay. Well, anyway, he, he talks about um, in a humorous way uh, some of what George Bush was up to in those days, and of course Gary Trudeau is a Saranac Laker, so we're all very proud of him for that. <laughs> so anyway, as I thought about the chair and thought about the chair. Um, I decided that it really needed something special to set it off. And that's where I came up with the president and the vice president. And I needed to add them someplace in the chair, which made the most sense to me. And so on this photograph, you can't really tell, but uh, I think there was a shot on a little bit earlier that showed exactly where their face was. 
And then here I can show you this one, I think, where it will show it. It's right there on the seat of the chair. And my thought with that was that the, I call the chair the green revenge, by the way. And the idea was that um, sitting on the chair, it becomes a small act of protest that leaves the environmentally concerned individual with a sense of well being and accomplishment. So, as frustrated as we might be trying to get things to change, at least we could sit on the chair. <laughs> and that pretty well sums up my chair, I think. <laughs> so, any questions? Here we go. Thank you, all three of you. It's really quite interesting to, to see how all of your different artistic perspectives came together and shows in your work in, in different ways. Um, so at this time, I think we're good to go to the, the Q&A. If anybody has any questions, you can type them right into the Q&A and I'll try to, to, talk to talk, ask them to our panelists here tonight. Um, and as we're waiting for some of those questions to come through. Um, I would love to ask all of you um, really quickly about how specifically the Adirondacks themselves have inspired how you changed and um, approach your work, largely because all of you have said that you've been a bunch of different places and that's affected you. But our exhibition is specifically about how the Adirondacks have inspired you. And I think it's really powerful that all three of you have decided to you know, build your career here. I'll jump in on that real quick. Um, I guess it's because uh, I'm here every day. Um, it's kind of fun to um, experience the mountains on a daily basis. It's fun to travel through them. It's fun to like wake up in the morning and see you know, a rainstorm and then drive through the mountains and then see the, the sun pop out. It's fun to experience the local flavor of people that are here in the Adirondacks. They're like no other around the world. Uh, I think we all have a spe specific uh, dialect uh, way of thinking here in the, uh, within the blue line, as you can say. And uh, I find it to be completely fascinating and a lot of fun to be a part of it uh, on a daily basis and uh, to interact uh, with people um, on a daily basis and to, to be a part of the scenery that we, we get to um, enjoy every day, you know, and sometimes we take it for granted. Um, I just flew in from, uh, spent the week in Banff skiing in the Canadian uh, Rockies and I came back and, you know, as beautiful as they were, um, this is equally as beautiful, you know, um, the streams, the colors, I mean, look at uh, the photographs that we just saw in the lecture, I mean, the, some of those uh, sunrise landscapes, I, you'll never see any place else, I mean, we have this whole geographical area is so unique and spectacular all on its own. Yeah, I definitely second that. Um, it's, um, you know, when you drive out of the Adirondacks and, and go elsewhere, uh, as you approach home, coming back into the mountains, it always just feels so good. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it all boils down to. I, I think you, you hit the nail yeah. on the head. The word is home. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah I think, uh, Tim, yeah. Tim, your opening statement, I, I do believe you used that word is home. Yeah. And I think that's our commonality of, uh, yeah. of the three of us. This is home. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. We choose to live here. It's, it's not a place where sometimes, you know, earning a living here is a challenge. Uh, sure. I, I have a saying that I, I kind of made up that um, I didn't move back to the Adirondacks to get rich. And so far, my plan is working. Um, <laughs> so whatever, yeah. whatever, any excuse we can, you know, to try to hang on, work seasonally or whatever, uh, just to live in a special place uh, is, is what we do. Uh, sure. 
I was born and raised here. So, of course, growing up, I didn't appreciate it. Um, and sure. of course, after traveling and seeing other places, um, I realized what a special uh, place this is indeed. And I think the rest of the world is certainly uh, noticing that as well. I hope not too many of them notice it, though. Yeah, uh, but, absolutely. But absolutely. It, yeah, you can't help but to live here and have it not influence your work. Sure. And we have some questions across a bunch of our um, watchers asking about sourcing materials, and it's a little bit for each of you. So we had someone ask you, Tim, if you're having um, trouble getting your large size paper for your for your watercolors and painting on that large size. Yes. Um, similarly, we have people asking Jonathan where he's sourcing the woods that he's using. <clears throat> Holly Burgess, specialty wood products up in the uh, upper Lake Placid toward Loon Lake. Holly Burgess has a, a, a mill in Bloomingdale. Right, there it is, Bloomingdale. Yep. Yeah, which is about a quarter mile from where I live. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so Ollie, yeah. Ollie basically supplies all of the great, great camp projects. He's a great yeah. uh, purveyor of wood um and anything odd that you may be looking for in a building project he has it yeah and anyone want, who wants to uh at, you know have specific questions about how i do or i mean they could certainly visit my my studio and i'd be glad to talk to them or they can email me uh through my website and i'd be glad to uh tell them where i get my my uh, my paper obviously uh because of where we live uh, we, I order everything online. Um, yeah. and, As do I. <laughs> yeah, so there's no secret. Yeah. You don't harvest it out the backyard? You don't harvest your own paper? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't have time to paint then, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. True enough. <laughs> and um... We have a question for you, Barry, asking um, if you're still using film or if you're digitally altering your, your images and are you doing your own developing and printing? Uh, well, the panoramic cameras that I had, <laughs> which a couple of examples of uh, pictures were taken with, were film cameras. Unfortunately, I no longer have them. I say, unfortunately, because I loved the cameras, but I, when digital came in and came in to the point where the quality was just as good as a film camera could produce, I decided to just throw everything into digital. Uh, so all of my equipment at this point is in fact digital. Um, and I do all of my own printing for the most part, uh, if, if I, and called upon to make a print that's larger than my printer can handle, I will get it done out of, out of studio. Um, but otherwise, in general, everything I do in photography is done right here in my studio or with a camera outside. Great, and I have one last question from an anonymous attendee that I think it's more of a, of a, a food for thought for our artist here. Have you ever thought of redesigning the iconic Adirondack pack basket? <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Maybe that, Jonathan, that might be a one for you. I, I'm up for redesigning anything or, or putting it out there for a round table design. I think that would be a great... Uh, new endeavor for the uh the museum to possibly have a show in five years you know it's like uh it, that again is another such an iconic form of um of the adirondacks and such a utilitarian element so i'd be all for it it's a great idea so um, with that, I think our program's coming to an end tonight, and I would like to thank all of you for joining us and especially thank our three speakers. Tonight's program has been record recorded, and it will be available on the museum's website later this week. 
Our next artist and inspiration program will be on March 13th, and it will feature Katie Wood Kirchhoff, a curator at Shelburne Museum in Vermont. In this program, Katie will be exploring Weston's paintings and journals while considering the ways his art and practice connected to the natural world, to the boundless freedom of the human spirit. And later this week, we have um, our last Taps and Trivia evening of the winter, and we'll be at Racket River Brewing <clears throat> this Wednesday. So if anyone's around, please do join us. Now that we have some snow, we also have sensory snowshoeing on Friday and a winter walk with Ed Cans on Sunday. And if you're an ADKX member or would like to join and become one, we have our members only night of Merlot under the moonlight. Mm -hmm. And then next month in terms of our um, virtual programming, we'll be bringing back our popular Dax Dishes series in collaboration with Albany Public Library. Uh, information on all of these programs and the registration is posted in our chat and can also be found on the adkx.org. And I'd like to wish you all a wonderful evening. And thank you very much to Tim, Barry, and Jonathan for um, spending your time with us this evening and telling us a little bit about your perspectives. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Tim and Barry. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night.